Beloved by God, once again, good morning. good morning to those of you here and those of you on our live stream. Blessed day to you. If you're a guest with us this morning, I also want to say super glad that you picked today to come and be with us. I get to be back with you. I traveled to see my mom in upstate New York. We did go to see my favorite place in the world, Lake Placid, New York, again. I would show you a picture, but my kids claim that I talk about Lake Placid too much. Kids are the ultimate truth tellers. I speculate that it's true they just don't like seeing their picture on the screen. That also could be. But we had a great visit, good to spend time with my mom. But I'm thrilled to be back with you and diving into this text from Ephesians chapter 4 that we're going to be diving into today. We start with just these first three verses of Ephesians chapter 4. Paul writes this, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. So friends, this first century church in the city of Ephesus found itself as a Christian church in the midst of a world and culture where people thought and acted differently than they did. Does that sound familiar at all to today? So the question becomes, how does the Christian approach living in a world where there's a lot of people around them who think and behave differently? And so Paul's going to start by urging them in the Lord that just because you're in that sphere doesn't mean you need to think or act like those others. And he describes those as having understanding that is darkened and separated from the life that is with God. The separation is due to ignorance, meaning they kind of sometimes don't even know the difference The Bible actually says their heart has gotten hardened, which then has really negative results and consequences. I was a little curious about that phrase, hardening of the heart, and kind of what that actually meant. So I looked back to see, how is that used in the first century? How is that actually used in the Bible? So the hardening of the heart language, it starts with the heart, the cardia, where we get the word cardio, heart stuff. As he described it, the other Greek word for hardening is the same word used for marble or stone. Meaning that because they had so turned from God, it was like their heart became like stone, meaning it was impenetrable. It couldn't be changed. It was stubborn, immovable. And simply telling that heart to change won't do it. And the reality is that's not just like an other's problem. That's an us problem as well. There are times when we think or act or behave in ways that don't honor our lives as Christians. So can I invite you to just think for a moment, are there areas in your life where you are holding on to old habits or old ways of thinking? As a part of our journey in the last couple of weeks, we had a chance to rent a vehicle. When we arrived at the airport, it was pretty clear that they had run out of vehicles. And watching the employees kind of scramble to make this work was a good test for my sanctification. Let's just say that. When we finally received a vehicle, we received a vehicle that we never would have paid for. It was like like a triple upgrade over what we had booked because it was the vehicle that was available at that right time. So we found ourselves then driving about a three-hour drive in this vehicle, and I started to think, I kind of really like this car. (laughs) My kids are in the back of this car like, Dad, we got to get a car like this. And so I'm there driving this thing. Basically, I probably need a CDL to drive. I mean, it's enormous. 
And I'm starting to think, but I'd really like a car like this. Man, I need a car like this. Right? Then he starts to catch himself, no, no, no. I've got two vehicles that are, I'm very, very, very fortunate to have at home. But I think that's like one example of ways in which it's so easy to get into a trap of thinking that isn't the thinking that the Lord would have us do. And the Apostle Paul tells us to recognize this. Like Christians, catch yourself when you find yourself going down this road. And he continues, verse 20, You, however, did not know to come to know Christ this way, meaning you know different. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. Like when those thoughts and patterns come up, put it off. Which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. And to be made new in the attitude of your minds. And to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So here's the Apostle Paul contrasting, hey, you used to think about things this way, but now as a Christian, you're invited and challenged to think about those things differently. He reminds us that we were taught to put off that old self and to put on what he calls a new attitude of our minds. And as Lutherans, we uniquely do this when we talk about returning to our baptism. I had folks who joined our church not too long ago. This is the first time they've ever been a part of a Lutheran church. And I asked them, hey, what are your observations kind of about Lutherans joining a Lutheran church? He said, well, first of all, you guys have communion a lot. (laughs) I'm like, yeah, we do. We kind of really like it. He's like, the other thing is you guys talk about baptism a lot. And I'm like, yeah, because we kind of really like it. And let me just talk to you very briefly about why. Baptism is a return to your salvation story. Baptism is a return for you to your salvation story. And here's what I mean by that. The Lord Jesus Christ lived a perfect life, suffered and died on the cross and rising again in victory on Easter. And in that moment, salvation is won for all of humanity. Like the Lord Jesus Christ delivers forgiveness on the cross. That's why he says it is finished. Like I did it. Baptism is then when that is when that gift is delivered uniquely to you, that becomes your salvation story. Baptism is when you are claimed as God's child, and it's when God says, you are mine. In fact, here's how Luther describes it, and it's beautiful correlation with this Ephesians text. Get this, he says, Moreover, these wild thoughts and appetites, and even a fall into sin, should not be regarded as an occasion for despair. Regard them rather as an admonition from God that we should remember our baptism and what was there spoken. To put that into my own words, what Luther is saying, hey, when wild thoughts or appetites kind of emerge in you, when you're driving the rental car and starts to talk to yourself into the fact that you need this, Or even when you have a fall into sin, when you find yourself having made a decision that you'd love to have back. Here's what you do. Rather than that being an occasion for despair, Luther says that's an exact moment when you should remember your baptism and what was spoken there, which is that you are a baptized child of God. Building off of it, he says this, you remember in that moment who you are, and to whom you belong. Recalling your baptism in the strength of him who has all power in heaven and on earth, you resolve, I cannot do that or say that or even think that. I am God's child. I belong to him. 
That is to say, that becomes the soundtrack, right? That you say to yourself in those moments where darkness seems to creep in. So can I tell you, there is such power in remembering who you are. And what a privilege it is for me as your pastor to remind you of that today. So then, if that is who we are, if that really is our identity, your identity and mine as a child of God, what does that mean for us as a church? And so can I briefly speak to that according to what the Apostle Paul says? Verse 25, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on you when you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Finally, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, just as in Christ God forgave you. One of the expressions I love is that if you want to see your community improve, start by sweeping your front porch first. Meaning any change that you want to see out there has got to start here. And then I would say here as we live together as Christians. If you find yourself like many thinking, man, I wish everything was so much better out there. I get that. But it starts here with us and it starts here with this family of faith. So can I, and I don't mean to give you homework, just as we're about to start school again, but can you, just something to think about. Let's call it a challenge. What if we committed to living like that here, in our homes, and in this family of God? Living with kindness and compassionate, compassion. So dear friends, may our lives ultimately be a testament to the transformative power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And may we also then continually seek to build up the body of Christ and how we interact with one another. Amen? Amen.